Great. Thank you uh, so much to the Unitize team uh, for hosting myself and Ken. Super excited to be here um, to cover personal finance uh, in the now modern world of 2020. Uh, so maybe starting off with introductions just for myself uh, and then Ken following um, and we can kick it off. Uh, so really quickly, um, my background, I started off uh, my career as a banking capital markets consultant uh, and then joined a startup out here in San Francisco um, that was focused on TMT investments uh, called Tegas, was able to scale that um, both in San Francisco and Chicago and had always been really interested in crypto and blockchain uh, specifically for the um, kind of cross-border uh, ability to transfer money um, around the world and uh, at the time had the opportunity to join Pantera Capital. Uh, so that's where I'm previously from. Um, today I'm at Falcon X uh, and the team whom I love, uh, Falcon X, we're a digital asset platform uh, trading um, most of the top uh, cryptocurrencies uh, right now servicing institutional investors. Uh, so with that, Ken, I'll let you uh, introduce yourself as well. Hi everyone, uh, truly a pleasure to be here today. Um, I, uh, my name is Ken Nguyen and uh, co-founder and CEO of Republic, uh, republic.co. We're one of the largest private investment platform where anyone can invest uh, in companies and crypto projects that we curate. Uh, I started out as a securities attorney uh, and went back into academia for a couple of years before joining AngelList back in uh, 2013-2014 as its first general counsel uh, and I think I bought my first Bitcoin right before the interview with Naval knowing that he would ask about it uh, and uh, that was you know I don't Good know call. <laughs> Uh, but that effort, um, you know, got very involved with uh, the regulatory implication of doing new things in fintech. Uh, out of that, we launched Republic when the law changed that allows people, anyone, not just millionaires, to invest in private securities. Uh, and I also helped co-found it Coinlist uh, as well in 2017. Uh, but fast forward where we are today, uh, we do all things private investing. You know, some a lot of it are tech companies and crypto projects. But we even have uh, real estate and game development financing. And I'm a firm believer uh, in a more democratized world uh, when it comes to the private market. Perfect. Yeah. So super excited to kind of double click on this, both on the tech side and, you know, more to your background, Ken, on um, kind of the legal side as well. That's led to some of these really awesome opportunities for folks to invest in alternative assets and investments. Uh, so one of the things um, in terms of today that keeps coming up and you'll probably chuckle when you hear this question, why isn't there more adoption? You know, what's holding people back and is something holding people back both kind of on the retail side and on the institution? side what do you think you know going back a little bit uh, to 2017 2018 I'm sure I think crypto enthusiasts at the time probably yeah. <laughs> you see much more adoption in the space by now you know by the end of 2020 wouldn't you say uh, yeah but fast forward a few years and through the crypto winter you still see more or less the same, um, you know, crypto enthusiasts and everyone else mm -hmm. knows about blockchain and definitely has heard of Bitcoin, but very few mm -hmm. people actually taken that step to, to buy, to invest, to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I do think adoption is the promise, the potential uh, of the entire industry, uh, how to make it more accessible, more mm -hmm. secure, easier to to hold these crypto mm -hmm, assets mm -hmm. uh, and you know we're doing our part at that but i wonder what you're seeing as well yeah yeah so i would i completely agree with you actually you know some of the trends we've at least seen uh this year is um similar to what i think a lot of folks have seen uh with the robin hood effect or the perhaps coinbase effect i call it uh on the crypto side and a lot of that you know when when the government um gave out stipends following uh the now official recession um a lot of that money uh which is really exciting for the space um was sent and put into crypto and i think coinbase was able to report on some of the those numbers uh, which is pretty exciting similarly on the retail side we are seeing 
that happen with Robin Hood. And I think one statistic, which is just crazy to me, is is Robin Hood actually has, I think, somewhere around 10 million accounts, as opposed to like 3 million that Morgan Stanley has. Um, but the average size of the account, Morgan Stanley is around 900K, whereas Robin Hood is anywhere between a grand to five grand. And so, the difference in accessibility there is, is huge. It's pretty simple and standard and straightforward to open a Robinhood account. Um, it's very difficult to open uh, a Morgan Stanley account. It takes way more clicks. Uh, you could lose the person somewhere along the lines. Um, and so, so I think uh, that's different there. Um, you know, the other thing that we're seeing more on the institutional side is, is uh, similar, again, to what we're seeing on the Robinhood side is that because more and more retail are coming in, the flows are a little different different, right? And so we were seeing a lot of, at times, sell pressure from Asia coming in, but the price was still coming up for a lot of, uh, whether it was Bitcoin or altcoins, um, mostly because of this buying pressure from the retail side in crypto. And I think uh, that's great to see uh, for the industry. But um, to your point, you know, it's more than just buying and holding. I think uh, being able to understand specifically um, what's going on with these assets, uh, where to comfortably store it in a secure place. Uh, these are all questions people are asking, and I don't know if there's a clear path or solution there. And one of the subsets of the industry, uh, you know, commonly known as digital securities or STO, mm -hmm been very underwhelming or you know performing below expectation the past couple of years and i think that's exactly is the problem the lack of adoption but on the other hand i do think that the next wave of um or the next 12 months and beyond people will naturally want to see real value underlying mm -hmm um these assets in order for them to get in meaning the retire dentist or lawyer in milwaukee or in uh, mm -hmm. london um you know may not just believe in supply and demand and, and and community engagement uh he or she would want to see that economic value underlying it and that's why mm -hmm. I think outside the republic very optimistic about uh, the future of sto mm -hmm. yeah no i couldn't i couldn't agree with you more. I think, you know, one of the things, and to your point, I, I kind of boil it down to a few things. The first is what you mentioned, right? Accessibility. Um, you know, how easy is it for people to buy uh, digital assets? Um, is it, you know, now with the potential news of Venmo and PayPal, hopefully that's really exciting and can open the market to additional retail folks. Um, but right now, it's I think the biggest players are Robinhood, Coinbase, uh, you have Cash App, all of these who, you know, some of which have also auto deposits, which again makes it much easier. But then the other question is just education. Um, I think, you know, one, one um, statistic that is very near and dear to my heart is that women and minorities are actually seven times uh, less willing to take on risk um, than men in the markets. And so a lot of that comes with just education in addition to accessibility. And so um, what would you say, I know Republic takes a lot of pride in both making things accessible and educating folks um, on the different products that they have on their platform. What would when you say to, to that? Yes, when you look at the venture uh, space uh, and uh, blockchain as tech uh, as an extension of that, there's no question that the number of uh, underserved founders, uh, female founders, black and brown, and those in cities and regions that, that have not traditionally gotten their attention pretty much anywhere that's not New York uh, and Silicon Valley, the two coasts, right? Uh, we have always, uh, we launched Republic with the, the mission of leveling that playing field. And today, 50% of the capital uh, on Republic, on the retail side of Republic, have gone to underserved founders. Uh, and mm -hmm. we do believe that particularly blockchain technology really does enable uh, a far more diverse subset of investors to participate. So here's an example. On day one, when we launched in 2016, the minimum investment amount in Republic was $50. Well, that's, you know, a reasonable amount and a low enough for people in the U.S., but you couldn't expect someone, a mom, a stay-at-home mom in Vietnam 
or Ecuador to invest $50. Why? Because the, the transfer fee, the international wire fee would already be more than that amount. So clearly it is wholly inaccessible. Now then we implemented Bitcoin investing. You can invest using BTC or ETH uh, and that brought the transaction fee to a very low affordable uh, mm -hmm. percent, mm -hmm. uh, you know, 10, 20 basis points, then we all of a sudden open up our investor base to people bef who before were locked out of this, you know, wealth generation uh, event. And, you know, the, the, the furthest iteration of that is that the Facebook, the Google, Amazon of the world uh, brought tremendous wealth to the economy, but it basically benefited the ultra wealthy. Mm -hmm investment banks and funds. And I think the next wave of technology, of crypto investing, of blockchain, gotta be much more diverse and accessible. And it's a legal hack in order to, to, to get that done. And, you know, we now uh, over half a million uh, investor uh, community at Republic, but we aim to be, you know, many, many more times uh, that size. Yeah, that's congratulations. That's a huge feat, especially in this space. And I, you know, couldn't agree with you more. I think um, we're seeing it on the institutional side as well. So, you know, I would say a year ago, if you were an institution, you wanted to find liquidity, you probably had at least seven tabs open on your screen with different service providers, all of whom had their own KYC AML onboarding process, which probably took two or so weeks. I mean, it was really um, painful to be an institution trying to trade in the space. Um, and, and these are sophisticated folks coming from traditional finance uh, who have had years of experience doing this, um, maybe on one platform with one broker. Um, and so, you know, that gave us at Falcon X a really huge opportunity to fill in that gap to create uh, much deeper liquidity across different platforms um, to provide. And I think same to your point on the retail side, it's uh, the accessibility. We, we keep coming back to this, this accessibility point. It's it still hasn't been solved. Um, and one thing I think is interesting, even to your point, you know, if you look in Robinhood and you're trying to buy uh, a stock like Amazon, um, you know, it's Amazon's really expensive. Not everyone has twelve hundred to thirteen hundred dollars to buy just one share, right? So you have maybe fractional shares, but not everyone gets access to that. So it always comes back to this level of accessibility, which I think on the retail front, Republic is doing a really good job of making that happen. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, and I, I uh, agree completely. It's all about UX. Uh, the more the friendlier uh, it is for end users, the more you're going to drive adoption. And I think, uh, like we, as we discussed at the beginning of the chat, uh, I do think that's the the potential of our industry. What's your take on Venmo and PayPal uh, <laughs> now enabling uh, people to, uh, to pay? Yeah. Time for the controversial questions. No, uh, <laughs> no, I think it's going to be great. I mean, um, the exposure to the marketplace is huge. It's undeniable. Um, I think, you know, it goes back to your point of UX. If the UX is really straightforward, and I, I personally think this is something that Robinhood has, has really struggled with, to me, when you're dealing with um, finance with a retail customer base, you have to go above and beyond to educate uh, folks um, and with the understanding that they probably don't know what the financial instruments they're using actually do and the risks associated with that. Um, and so I think, you know, unfortunately, Robinhood um, has kind of, kind of fallen short uh, on that, especially with recent news. Um, I would hope that with Venmo and PayPal, it depends on the use case. If it's just to move crypto around, that could be interesting. If it's like the Robinhood version where on Robinhood, you're not actually purchasing crypto, you're purchasing the value of Bitcoin at that specific time. Alternatively, you have um, Cash App where you're actually holding the Bitcoin on in a hot wallet um, that you can then move the actual currency around. Um, Cash App is very uh, Bitcoin maximalist, so I'd be really excited once they start to offer alternative coins as well. Um, but it'll be interesting to see what side PayPal and Venmo um, take. Are they going to take the position of just sending money around? Are they going to take the position of actually creating an investment vehicle um, where you can buy, hold, store it? Um, all of which, again, are, are difficult questions to answer. I imagine that uh, it will be some time before they enter the investment world yeah. or off 
or investment products only because that invites a whole new bucket of compliance and regulatory mm-hmm. complexity mm-hmm. Uh, that, that I gathered that it's so outside of their business model as a money transmitter, uh, a payment facilitator. Right. Uh, be interesting to see, but yes, uh, the 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 level of regulation uh, and sophistication required to operate in in uh, in the industry that we are in uh, in some way that's a huge barrier to to market in and by itself. Yeah, no, <laughs> absolutely. I think it's the one thing uh, everyone on this conference will uh, will definitely agree to. Uh, the U.S. you know regulatory. Um, environment makes it very difficult uh, I think to be uh, creative in this space and so hopefully um, I think things will change in the long run. I'm curious to get your take on some alternative investments um, as well things that are popping up in the space whether it's like staking, DeFi, what are your thoughts on some of these new New yeah, you know, the uh, Republic itself, not to be uh, promotional about, but we're rolling out what is, you know, completely new in the industry is a profit sharing token, uh, but it's widely available to non-accredited uh, investors, which people didn't even know that it's legally possible, uh, but it is. Uh-huh. And uh, I think the notion of investing into enterprises and businesses that pay out uh, a profit, future profit, future revenue uh, is, uh, I think, is probably, uh, the, again, uh, I think will be, will define a whole new uh, investment asset class um, for, mm-hmm. for us. And blockchain technology in so many ways, you know, weaves itself into every single uh, asset class. Fractionalization, automation, necessarily mm-hmm. means we're going to participate and out of that, I mean a, a function of how the the stock market the public stock market has managed to be you know more robust than what people expected yeah. uh, a few months ago I think it has a lot to do with the number of traders that like you said mm-hmm. now enter on Robin Hood or otherwise and trade at a lower uh, um, uh, you know, dollar volume. Uh, but in the aggregation, in aggregation it's uh, a lot more uh, capital uh, getting, you know, funnel uh, into the system. But uh, man, the next 12 months, uh, I think would be so fascinating to see. I'm highly, highly bullish, but, uh, but you know, now much remains to be seen, right? Yeah, yeah, I couldn't I couldn't agree with you. And you actually mentioned a point that I think is super important to to know is um yields, you know, generating a yield down the line. I think, you know, going back to the point we discussed about education, not everyone uh clearly understands how important it is to make your money work for you while it's just sitting in an account and what generating yield might be. So, um it's funny, I have a lot of friends now uh, in just the traditional space who have no idea that they could put their assets into a yield generating savings account versus just a savings account where they generate zero yield. And I think um, the c- crypto community is just so uh, obsessed with yield generation, which is great. Uh, so, you know, you have staking on one side. Um, I think one thing uh, we've heard a lot of, at least recently on, on our side is, yield farming, um, <laughs> which I'd be curious to hear your take on it, especially with Compound recently, you know, exploding with popularity. Yeah, you know, I mean, it remains to be seen whether or not it's truly scalable at that rate, but uh, they're looking at yield that you get for more traditional asset, forget about just like cash deposit, um, even more, you know, credible established uh, yield fixed income instrument to get something like 8%, 9%, 10%. Mm-hmm. And higher is like a remarkable yield. And I think much right. of the investing public still don't even know about that. Like if you ask my right, parents, right. Or, you know, a, uh, they didn't know that the concept of which uh, never even occurred to them. So I think there's a lot of potential there. But we all have also, we haven't tested out the limitation of it. Like, is this right. something that can sustain, you know, $10 billion in investment volume or right. you know, $1 trillion? Uh, what's your right. take on the, the future of, of, uh, of this? Yeah, good question. Um, so it's funny. I remember when I first heard the term yield farming, the first image that came to my mind is not ag- ex- not at all what yield farming actually looks like. So essentially, it's really just, you know, you collateralizing something either with a stable coin or sometimes a really volatile coin. And then, um, you know, you lending out 
uh, that amount and then receiving in compound comp tokens, which you can sell and then just continue to go through that circle. So that circle of just collateralizing, borrowing, collateralizing of um, supplying and borrowing is yield farming, which is not at all what I thought it would be um, when I initially heard the term. Um, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, essentially, if there are negative borrow rates for positive lending rates, that doesn't necessarily align. And it means that there has to be some incentive um, within the system right now to create the marketplace, which is very, very normal. Um, however, those incentives, like you mentioned, with something like $10 billion pumped into uh, the system, it, it's unsustainable. And so um, it's a good place to find maybe perhaps riskier yield. Uh, but at the same time, you can, you know, in two minutes, put your money on BlockFi and get 8% on the year. Um, and so I think the biggest thing is, um, one, make your money work for you. And two, you know, always analyze the counterparty risk of where you're storing your capital. So like even if your capital is on BlockFi, and you could probably speak to this really well, right? Even if your capital is on BlockFi or it's with Compound, if it's on an exchange, you know, us working with institutional investors, we really double down to this. What are the capital um, risks of leaving money with a custodian, somewhere else, you know, um, it's because it's all great when it's 8% yield um, until it disappears. And so uh, something you need to constantly keep in mind um, in this space, but curious to hear your take as well. What you said um, just, you know, led me to, to an observation about arbitrage opportunities, you know, in the past, yeah. uh, as meaning five years ago, or, or 10 years ago, a lot of these investment classes, the most attractive ones, there was a barrier in terms of, you know, just straight up minimum investment amount. You could not mm -hmm. possibly participate in a fixed income product if you couldn't yeah. write 20,000, if not a $200,000 check, right? Only for millionaire. Right. And right, now right. technology, which changes in the law, pretty much anyone can, little, like you said, in five minutes invest 200 bucks and still get 8% uh, fixed income or anyone right. with $10 can invest in a private stock on Republic um, or do an index fund like the Republic token. But the arbitrage here is information. It's the lack of information. 99.9% .9 of the investing public in the United States and outside yeah. do not know that they can, you know, right. generate 8% return that easily. Right. So right. the next, phase of it is very much about education and how yeah. to get information out in a targeted fashion in a, at a time when there's an influx and over and data overwhelming amount of data that makes it almost like you know no data at all because no one can pass through the information right right so yeah it may very well be that that arbitrage in information and how to how to bridge that gap or how to level the playing field by better education and content seems to be the the, the name of the game for for private investing uh, in in the next phase yeah yeah i couldn't i couldn't agree with you more if i had um two messages uh for people coming off of this and i would love to hear yours listening to this it's make your money work for you uh, and figure out a way to generate yield um and educate yourself to your point on counterparty risks on options that are out there just um you know there are resources available on the web um, and i think us as a community we need to do better at making them more accessible agree uh, did you say that I uh, share a message? <laughs> yeah, yeah, what are your two? <laughs> uh, well, given the topic of this session, uh, I don't know if people realize that, but 75% of Fortune 500 companies in the year 2020, 2030, 10 years from now, have yet to exist today. So the companies, the technologies that literally will be defining how we will be living and working in the future uh, today are in someone's garage, and that's the, 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 the opportunity to be a part of that, I think gotta start now. So people should look well beyond just the public market. Uh, and, but like you said, it's highly risky. Uh, invest in a way that is responsible, in a way that you can tolerate the risk and assume the risk involved, but uh, to the extent that, that uh, you have investable asset, I do think that the private market uh, and, mm -hmm. uh, and blockchain or, or blockchain leveraged uh, private investment opportunities ought to be part of someone's, you know, everyone's portfolio. 
yeah yeah definitely that one percent just make it one percent of your portfolio and <laughs> we'll all be super happy um with that <laughs> thank you ken so much for taking the time and thank you unitize um for hosting us today really really excited to be here thank you thank so you. much for having me. thank you everyone for tuning in and unitize uh, uh incredible to uh, have this conversation today and to be a part of the conference